Hello and welcome to Author Audit, the show where you get a sneak peek into the creative process and minds of your favorite writers. Today, our special guest is, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself Dr. and Paul your book? Hardy. I'm Dr. Paul Hardy, the founder of Recovery for Life and Transition Homes for Hope. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on today. I was wondering to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and your background. Yeah, and so um, I'm a Virginia Beach resident and uh, grew up here most of my life. Uh, and uh, so went away to college and then we lived in Spain and Mexico City. So I'm fluent in Spanish. And then uh, we came back here to work uh, and founded the Recovery for Life program, which is a treatment center where we have worked with probably about 10,000 people with addictions of different kinds and uh, and really have served the community in a great way in the last 20 some years. And uh, just, you know, having a great time with life, enjoy what we do and uh, mm -hmm. all that we are. It's great. Wow, that's awesome. Oh my gosh. Uh, so what's a fact about you that nobody would guess? Uh, you know, I don't know. I play the guitar. People don't know about that usually. Uh, I love spicy foods from Mexico. And, uh, you know, we've been married for 42 years yesterday. So I'm happily married and have 13 grandchildren. Holy cow. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah. Um, so they have these, uh, they have these like watermelon treats where essentially they dip them in like a chili powder. Do, do you like that by chance? Yeah. And uh, the same thing with corn. They take corn and roll it in mayonnaise and then pour cheese all over it and sprinkle that with uh, cayenne pepper. And uh, yeah, I remember my wife, uh, We first time we ever had a Mexican family over for dinner. And and so she got a recipe and she fixed this uh, fish stew and she had me taste it and I was crying. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so hot. So the people got there like an hour and a half late. So they finally get there and uh, we serve the stew that she's made and they're like, um, don't you have any peppers? I mean, it's not hot. And I was crying. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's just not, no joke. You probably, most Americans cannot eat the food they eat. It's so spicy. Oh, no, I love, I adore spicy foods. I kind of live up to my name. Um, <laughs> it's, my my dad is, is a huge spicy food cook. So, like, I, I've, I've grown up with, like, a variety of different, like, spices thrown into things. My dad's gotten to the point where he's desensitized us to habaneros, and it's like, wow, I wish I could find something spicy. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I've got a little um, habanero, bush, a little, a little bushes in my backyard that I'm growing, mm -hmm. and I can't wait till they start blooming mm -hmm. and having fruit. Be awesome. Um, so I was curious, who was your role model as a kid, and why? You know, we, uh, the questions that I asked myself from the beginning was, how do people change and um, how can we translate everyday living into something that people can actually do? Mm -hmm. You know, and the more I saw therapy and counselors uh, looking into what they were doing, it was all theoretical. And so I said, I want to do something different. I want to write books that are practical and that people can actually do something that will change their lives as a result of that material and yeah. so all of the books that I write I have the idea of the end reader as a workbook where they can write in um, their own experiences and yeah. I said I want to do something that will produce a catalyst of change in people's lives that's awesome I mean like and that kind of also goes along with the lines of like creating creating habits that are that are positive and healthy coping mechanisms and it it really causes it from what it sounds like you're really trying to encourage the reader to like continue to like get those healthy coping mechanisms so they don't really continue down the path that they're on and that's that's something that's such an amazing approach because I don't think I've ever heard anybody like sort of do that aside from like journaling and stuff like that that's that's awesome so well what we do is we we dig deep Mm -hmm. And we ask ourselves the kind of questions of, you know, what has gone wrong in my life? You know, people don't go to counseling. They don't look for counseling books. They don't look for self-help books because they're doing well. They usually are trying to get help. And so in letting go and living free, the premise that I had was you have to look backwards and see what's gone wrong in your life. You have to yeah. look inward and see what you can change in your own life. Then you have to look upward and ask for God's help and get the help that you couldn't do on your own. And those three view, visions of it, um, they, they kind of give you the complete package of saying, here's a prescription for change. What in my past do I need to rework? 
you can't relive the past. You can't fix your past, but you can reframe it. Yeah. Um, what do I need to change in my present as far as my habits, coping mm -hmm. skills, behaviors? And then how do I need God's help to do those things? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that that makes, that's, seriously, that's awesome that you're, that you're encouraging that sort of thing. And I, I completely agree. Like you, you can't necessarily change your past, but if you're able to find a way that you're able, you're like, you reflect on it and you think, okay, this is what went wrong. So this is, if this happens again, this is how I'm going to change it. And this is how I'm going to be better. And that it's, again, it's amazing that you're encouraging that sort of behavior. Um, so I have a quick question. If, if you didn't go into therapy, and uh, this kind of goes along the lines of um, like when, when kids are in kindergarten, their kindergarten teachers ask them, oh, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And normally kids will be like, oh, I want to be a veterinarian or, oh, I want to be a ballerina. Did you have anything in particular that you wanted to be when you were younger that you didn't end up pursuing? Or did well, you end up pursuing yeah. your home? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of strange, as goofy as it is. And you won't really probably relate to this in your generation. Um, when I was growing up, we had what was called school patrol or safety patrol. Oh yeah, we had that. I was, I was on the, safety right. And so you, you had a white, um, uh, belt thing that you wore with a, yeah. a badge on it. And, and so I got to be safety patrol. I got to, you know, uh, tell people to go forward and not and stop and crosswalks and stuff. And I said, man, I'd love to be like that kind of person, you know, that, that gets to direct traffic or be a cop or a police officer or some kind. And so I never did that. And yet I've worked with law enforcement uh, all these years, you know, probation officers, police, uh, and all that kind of thing. I was a police chaplain for nine years here in Virginia Beach. But, you know, originally I had really thought of it more of a, you know, that was my aspiration, you know, and then uh, didn't really do that in the full-time sense. But yeah, I would love to have been some kind of law enforcement. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So I was wondering what your actual writing process regarding the book was. Um, so some writers, a lot of the time, uh, are very fluid about their writing, but uh, there's also the other set of writers that kind of block out exactly the amount of time that they need to write. And they're like, I'm going to write for 20 minutes and I'm not going to move during that time, just writing. Are you one or the other, or are you kind of both? I'm a bone collector. So I took a course, uh, I went to Nashville, the first book I wrote, and um, I had written uh, this book about grief and grieving. And so um, I went to Nashville with a team of writers, and they took my book apart, and just shredded it, and asked me millions of questions. And, you know, why did you write it this way? Why did you say that? Why did you? And I'd used an acrostic as the framework of the book. Um, mm -hmm. And they well, why did you use? And so I had to defend my writing. And I learned from that experience, as painful of it, as it was at the moment, I learned how to make sure that I can defend my premises. So yeah. I start out with a premise. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, as goofy as it sounds, I make a spreadsheet. And so the spreadsheet will have eight, 10 or 12 columns, according to the, like this book has 10 chapters. So I had 10 columns. So mm -hmm. each chapter then becomes a bucket list. And so I start filling in the bucket list of each chapter with a key question, a premise, uh, uh, a story. A, and so I start filling in those boxes in the spreadsheet so that I have a flow. I'll put the title of the chapter at the top of the spreadsheet, and then I'll just go out and collect information about that topic. Um, I'll uh, read copious amounts of articles and materials. I'll uh, find quotes and, and research uh, and those type of things. So I, I give an example like um, this thing that I developed, uh, I call it the C model. And I did a lot of research as to what, what the um, scriptures teach and what does the Bible say about healing. And I went through all, I'm just studying and researching in that. So each of those columns then begins to fill up mm -hmm. in bullet points. And from the bullet points, then I can make a narrative. And so then that all comes together. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have a schedule that I've disciplined myself. What I usually do, um, you know, um, I get in from uh, different programs and jobs and things that I'm doing usually about, you know, seven o'clock at night or so. I may have a treatment group in the evening every now and then. But uh, my wife and I, you know, we uh, record TV shows that we enjoy. So we'll watch a couple of 
hours of TV together on the couch. And then when she goes to bed, I'll spend another two hours writing. And, um, but I, you know, I don't have a, a half to system about it. Um, yeah, I don't usually get writer's block. Uh, you know, it's not like I get stuck because I have such a variety of themes to, to write from. And, uh, you know, I can always research and develop one of those themes and uh, work out on my bucket list of, of those 10 chapters in that case. Wow. Um, so does, does writing energize or exhaust you? I'm sorry, you got cut off. Does writing energize or exhaust you? Does it energize me? Yeah, um, it really does because um, I'm, I'm in a constant state of discovery. Mm. And so even as a therapist, when I'm working with someone and, you know, I have dozens of stories in the book that are all, you know, um, anonymous and I change situations and names so that they don't uh, reveal anybody's confidentiality, but they're, they're somewhat like case studies of people um, that have given me permission to share their story. And I'm constantly learning myself and I cannot teach something I don't learn. I can't, I, I'm the type of person, I can't ask you to do something that I'm not doing or that I'm not available to do. And so it just is so energizing and, and enjoyable to me because I'm experiencing what I'm writing and I'm writing what I experience. And that just makes it come alive. Wow. Yeah, and I, I mean, like writing, being able to sort of write in the moment and about your own experiences gives it, gives it a totally different energy I feel like because you're you're generally talking about how your actual like your perception of the the thing that was happening it happened <laughs> and it gives a, a different perspective just then like because there's many different sides to different stories and I I think that's it's awesome that you're taking your own experiences and you're helping other people learn from those experiences because that's sometimes yeah, that's a, a really it's difficult a different process for example um, mm -hmm. if you're writing a novel that is, uh, you know, fiction or fantasy, mm -hmm. then you have to create everything in your mind. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, sometimes it may be somewhat autobiographical if you're using your own experiences, mm -hmm. but, you know, you have to create characters and you have to make up the fictional, you know, what the storyline goes into. And I would like to do that eventually one day. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be a strange book to write a fiction on counseling, but I think it'd be fun. <laughs> Stranger than life, you know, but... Uh, but, Wait, that uh, could be the title. <laughs> experiences and um, trying to educate people with bite-sized things that they can actually live, practice, and, and do. Uh, it's a different way of thinking about it, but it still is very enjoyable for me. Um, you know, so I, I talk to counselors from time to time that, um, you know, have been doing what I do for many years. Um, you know, a lot of times they're burnt out, they're tired, they're, you know, the same old, same old to them. I get a new job every hour, uh, every hour when that person walks into the room and I'm able to work with them on their problems and their situations. Um, that's a whole new life for me for that hour. And I'm able to help that person come to conclusions, solutions and, and that sort of thing. So it, it just always keeps it interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you really love your job. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, so what would you say were some common traps when you were writing? Uh, I know that you said you don't get writer's block, but was there anything that kind of tripped you up a little bit and that you wish that you would have known how to avoid when you started writing? Um, I'm not the disciplined writer that has to write 20 minutes at a time every day or, uh, you know, that I have it blocked on my schedule. Mm -hmm. um, it's more free floating for me. Um, mm -hmm. I do kind of have to be in the mood to write. So, um, you know, what might happen is if, if mentally um, I'm tired or, you know, I just need a break from everything that's going on because I am working with people so much, um, then what gets in the way for me is more of the distraction side of it, that, you know, I'd rather uh, be doing something else and, or I take up a hobby and I'd rather do that hobby than write. So in that sense, you know, there's the discipline of constantly working on your craft, um, but having the balance to be able to enjoy your craft and not and not become a drudgery to you. You know, I gotta go right. Oh yeah. Yeah, there are times when I have to go right. You know, it's it's uh, what I gotta do. But most of the time I'm excited about it. And I'll, you know, I'll go back to one of those chapters and tweak it 
you know, or uh, something I've, I've read, something I've learned, I'll add back into something new. Uh, you know, here at our office, uh, my staff gets very frustrated with me because I'll have a workbook that we use and I'll edit it. And they're like, you just finished the book. You're editing it. I'm well, I learned something new. I got to add to it. You know, um, fortunately, I, that those kind of books I print on demand here and I'm able to edit them whenever I want and change what I do, you know. Speaking of editing, I was curious if you ended up editing anything out of your book. Um, yeah, so um, I wrote a book called Break Free Now, which mm -hmm. we have sold hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of. Uh, everyone that comes to treatment here uses that book. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it is a, a combination of experiences and training and material and positive psychology. Uh, and we use the, the 12 steps in that book. Um, and it might be that I get an article that's come out that's just just recently explained some new concept that works. And I'll analyze that. I'll turn it in and out, rip it up and down and, and go through it and say, well, wow, uh, you know, here's something that that seems to work. And uh, I'll teach that. I'll kind of field it. And if it works, then we'll add it to the book, you know. Uh, and I've been working on the book, literally working on the book uh, probably for 10 years now you know? Oh my gosh. And yeah. Yeah. And like I said, thousands of people have had the benefit of that because, uh, you know, people, uh, have an addiction and they come to group treatment, they've gotten a DUI and they're in group treatment. Then, uh, the material that I present to them, they're going to go through that in such a way that it'll be beneficial to them. Yeah. Um, so if you could change anything about the book that you recently published, what would you change and why? What would I change? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this particular book, Letting Go Living Free, is the culmination of my philosophy of counseling and of really living life. Um, as far as something that I would change, I, I guess the only thing that I can think of, I might would update some of the stories. Yeah. Um, I, I, I counsel high school students at times. Uh, you know, maybe they've been arrested for smoking marijuana or for possession. Um, the level of anxiety with high school students today is off the charts. Uh, yep. Depression and anxiety. anxiety. And mm -hmm. I probably will make a book out of it. I want to do a study on what is the source? What is the commonality of this broad, widespread anxiety with uh, younger people? Um, and so it might would be that some of the stories that I tell in the book, maybe I would update those to something that's maybe younger uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, maybe some different types of problems. Uh, I think that's the only thing I can think of. But rather than do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do research and write a book on anxiety for sure. That'll be one of my next things. Uh, I'm working on a book right now that I think is going to be just a lot of fun uh, for couples. Uh, it's called How to Get Along with a Hard to Get Along with Spouse. <laughs> and so, you know, how do you get along with difficult people? And uh, that's going to be another practical manual. But, um, yeah, I think we've got to address the, the whole anxiety. You know, growing up, I never really experienced much anxiety. I didn't have any, I don't relate to it. Uh, and so to have a two generations that I can see that have grown up with a severe level of anxiety. We, we have to address that. So I'm going to work on it. Absolutely. I completely agree. I mean, I've, I've been a huge mental health advocate, basically my, since I was able to have like consciousness of that, because I've, I've suffered from anxiety pretty much my entire life. Uh, and it's, it can really affect people's quality of life if they don't have proper coping mechanisms. Yep. And it's, I, I really do think that there needs to be a better support system in a lot of schools right. because it can, I, I mean, like I, it was really difficult for me to complete a lot of, of classes because they just got super overwhelming and I didn't have a proper support system sometimes. Yeah. And I, I mean, if we're able to address that, I feel like there would be a lot more people that would be a lot more successful in, in just in right. general. So I, that, that'd be an awesome book if you're able to, I mean, the, the only thing that I've found commonality with yet, and you would know better than I so far, um, it seems that, as I said, we're looking at two generations of this. 
your generation and the kids coming up behind you, um, there's a lack of grounding and anchoring in people's lives. Yeah. Um, I think many times it has to do with uh, the way that their parents um, did or did not raise them. Either more than not, I think, was more of neglect than it was, you know, my generation, and, and I'm being very general, and my generation grew up with a lot of abuse. Uh, you know, my father, his father, his grandfather, um, you know, the way they disciplined children was to beat them, uh, put them down constantly. You know, if I give you a room to sleep in and food to eat, that's what you get for love. That's all you're going to get. Um, so our response to that, I don't think, was really anxiety um, yeah. as much as it was to work harder. And so yeah. as my generation and the generation after me um, worked and worked and worked, mm -hmm. um, then I think the next two generations came up feeling distant, disconnected, mm -hmm. um, what I'm calling unanchored or uh, un ungrounded, mm -hmm. uh, because I have students all the time that tell me, I don't know my parents. I don't know. Yeah. Don't care yeah. to know. Not interested. Yeah, I mean, like, it, I can completely understand that. I feel like because of that, that disconnect, and it kind of, it translates into the other people not feeling like they didn't have a parent role themselves, which translates into them not yeah. wanting to, or not knowing how to be a parent role in yeah. their children's lives. And mm -hmm. I, I can completely understand that. And it, not having that support system, and then looking for it at, in a learning environment, and then not having it there either because there's that same generation that your parents are in that is teaching in schools a lot of the time, it's, it's really difficult that and then the the workload in general in both school and in like, in the, the work environment in general has just significantly increased. Um, I, I mean, like I would, when I was still in high school, I would go home with at least four hours of homework. And I was at school from from eight until three. So then that gets me down to seven. And then there's like no time, no time to, to eat dinner as a family. There's no time to spend time with your family. And I, when I mean like four hours of homework, I mean with a light load and it's having that forced onto your children more and more. And not, that's not even including like, if you have, if you have to have a job to help support your family, because they're also struggling, it's, it's a really hard balance and it's, it can be detrimental to families and to mental health. And I, I like, I've personally experienced some of that. And it's, again, anxiety is something that can completely derail people. And I really do feel like there needs to be more that people speak about that and more support systems. And I you sense that people are just growing up with a lot of fear. A, a part of that too. Uh, and like, a lot of, of fear of getting close to other people because they didn't feel close to others when they were growing up. Oh, wow. Yeah. So anyways, that, that, that says a lot right there. So we may just have a book in the making right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so That's interesting. Um, I was wondering what uh, what's the most difficult of your artistic process or difficult part about your artistic process when you are writing? Um, one of my difficulties is I gather so much material mm -hmm. um, is, you know, cherry picking and finding exactly the right fit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that that would be one thing. Um, I, I think for me personally, it's finding the balance between being too intellectual on one hand mm -hmm. and then too practical on the other hand. So you, you have to find a balance between those two. So, you know, for example, if you have something that you're asking someone to practice, you need to have the science behind that that proves that it works. Mm -hmm. um, some of the theories that I propose in letting go living free um, in the psychological world are new. Mm -hmm. So when I say new, um, anything in the counseling world and psychology that's 10 years old is brand new yeah. because it's in the process of being proven. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we've had the opportunity now um, to have uh, some of the premises have been proven by universities now uh, mm -hmm. as to how they work. Um, and so that, that balance between, you know, explaining things too deeply mm -hmm. and then staying lighthearted and even enough that people actually want to read it. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense, you know, yeah. between, 
uh, you know, this is a, a psychology primer or is it a book that I want to read to help myself? Yeah, yeah. Having having a good balance between those those two is ex is extremely important because it also keeps the the reader engaged, as, especially if they're like if they're a part of the psychology field or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Having some like science behind it gives reassurance to those that aren't, and it gives it fulfills like that. Mm -hmm. Oh well, this is the science behind it for those that are in the field. So that's that's awesome. It, it's it's astounding that you're able to find a balance between those for your book. And I, that's it, what, what I strive for, but that is a big yeah. challenge. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what sort of advice would you give to new aspiring writers that are hoping to get their start in the publishing world? Yeah. Um, by the way, writer's block, in my opinion, is writer's fear. Ah. And every time I've ever had any sense of writer's block, here's the question I've asked myself is anybody freaking going to read this book? <laughs> you know, I mean, when I, when I start translating, is, is anybody going to read what I'm writing or is this interesting to anybody? Does anybody really want to hear this? Then I get stuck. And the way I get unstuck is to say, well, I'm going to write it anyway and I'll field test it. And if people don't like it, we'll, we'll amend it and fix it. But my advice to people that aspire to write um, and as trite as it may sound, you have to write about something you actually care about. You know, it's got to, if your first thought is I'm going to try to make money by writing, you're in big trouble. It, it doesn't work that way. I've written and written and written uh, many things that will never gain me a dollar. But, um, you know, they say, you know, you got to plant a tree, have a child and write a book. Well, okay, got those three done. But, um, <laughs> but I, I really, I, I think, if a person really aspires to write, it needs to be things that they care about that are translatable for other people in some area of their lives. Even if it's fantasy or fiction, um, you know, th there's a reason why you're sharing that story. I mean, if you're writing about, you know, outer, sp outer space aliens or some kind of a, you know, whatever, or romance story, whatever it means, uh, we're, we're all salesmen. Yeah. And so you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to sell? You know, what is, the, I, I sell ideas, I sell concepts all day long, and my writings are all the fulfillment of selling an idea to people, um, something you care about. You have to realize that as you write, that you're selling something, um, and I, you got to realize, too, it is ultra competitive out there. I, I mean, you know, the space on the bookshelves for books, the volume of books that are coming out. Um, you're going to have to persevere when nobody would else would persevere. You, you just have to keep at it and keep at it and keep writing and keep developing your craft, keep honing on it, uh, sharpening things, learning, um, you know, whether it's a seminar or, you know, everybody's watching YouTube videos now, um, whatever it might be that will help you be a better writer. You, you have to consider it to be a true craft and not just a hobby. Um, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily full time in it, but that you take it seriously is what I'm trying to say. Take it seriously to the point that, you know, it you're writing as a professional, even if you're not a professional. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. And again, like I said earlier, having a passion for the thing that you're you're writing is extremely important because it shows it shows in in the way that you you indicate your tone, even with like simple simple descriptions of the settings and uh or if you're going into like deep dive of like a certain like for example psychology subject um mm -hmm. if you don't have that passion behind what you are writing and that hope to to just put your words out there and let people know hey this is this is my work I'm proud of it it's something that I love if you'd like to read it be my guest otherwise it it's it's just how I feel and I I mean again, like, if you put that passion in your book, it makes it like a whole nother level of amazing, in my opinion. So yeah. Um, speaking of hobbies, by the way, uh, we're going to shift away from questions about the book. And I was wondering if you could go a little bit more into depth of what you like to do when you're not writing. Uh, well, you know, I, <laughs> I collect cheap guitars. <laughs> and uh, so my son will give me a call and he'll say, Dad, I found this guitar on such and such a, you know, whatever website, uh, you know, and it's real cheap and, uh, but it's really a good buy, you know, and so I'll find a guitar that is very 
inexpensive and then I'll fix it up a little bit and it'll be worth a lot more money. My problem is I don't sell them. I collect them. Um, so I have a wall full of guitars that uh, I just, I sit and jam, mess around with, you know, don't think nothing professional, but I enjoy that. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a real good stress relief. I turn the amp up as loud as it go if my wife's not home, you know, she can't handle it. So I make sure she's not around. Turn the amp up loud and uh, just, you know, blast away and have a good time. And, and it keeps a different type of creativity for me, uh, but it's a fun hobby. And then, you know, during the whole, I was hoping I would go through the interview without mentioning the word COVID, but here it is. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, during the whole COVID situation, um, you know, during lockdown, I, you know, they said that the, um, you know, hardware stores were essential, yeah. fortunately. So I became best friends with our largest box home uh, store and, uh, and started taking up woodworking. And so, uh, you know, I built a set of uh, rocking chairs for my wife that uh, turned out pretty good. They actually rock. <laughs> and so I did that. Um, I, you know, I built a table that folds up into the wall and it actually folds and it fits and it's square. So I took up a, a woodworking a hobby and uh, kind of built my garage into a little bit of a, a woodworking shop. It's not very big, but yeah, that was a lot of fun and, and gave me something new to kind of, you know, you, you need something that kind of challenges your thinking. And it did challenge me a lot. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, quick question. Do you only collect electrics, acoustics, or do you also collect bass guitars by chance? Electric. Yeah, just electric guitars. Yeah. I mean, my son, you know, he calls up dad. Dad, I found this guitar you're going to want, you know. Brand uh -huh. new Epiphone guitar, electric guitar in the box, you know, for under $100. <laughs> you know, probably I'm would sell for three, three fifty. dollars you know. Um, so I bought that yeah. immediately. Um uh, he called me the other day. That was that was a couple of years ago. Just recently called, and there was this guitar that was very unique. I'd never seen one like it. The guitars I buy, they're always under a hundred dollars, right? Uh -huh. And uh, I get it for under a hundred dollars. I look it up; it's three hundred eighty-five dollars. Just had to tweak a couple things on it, put new strings on it. But I'm not going to sell it because I like it. It's a really, yeah. really different guitar. Uh, I yeah. found one that was Japanese made that is a very rare guitar, oh. and I paid a little bit more for that, but doubled mm -hmm. the value of that. So, you know, I don't know. One day, maybe my kids will sell them and make a little money on them. I don't know <laughs> when I'm gone. They won't do it now. Yeah. But, you know, each the thing is, each of them has a different sound, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I play guitar, and that's why I was kind of curious. I, I play bass and acoustic and electric, and I I love the, like, the, the variety of the sounds that guitars have and the, the pedals give them, uh, because it's okay. like having paintbrushes, essentially. Let me, where, let me show you this. If you can see it. See that guitar? Uh-huh. Yeah, so that's an Alhambra from Spain, from southern Spain, handmade. And uh, uh, I bought that when we lived in Madrid. And it is still today, I mean, that guitar is probably 40 years old and just plays as true as can be. Uh, it's made out of cypress wood and it's beautiful. It's banged up. I mean, you know, um, but uh, it's yeah. been around so long. But yeah, it's a beautiful guitar and it plays well. That's awesome. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, so what three words do you feel like would describe you best? Um, searching. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly searching for information. I'm searching for, uh, you know, materials, new ways to look at things. Mm -hmm. uh, a hyphenated word, that way I get two. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Deeply spiritual. I love God. I love to talk about God and I don't debate about God. I'm very comfortable and grounded in my faith, but I enjoy talking to people about their faith and their journey. Um, so I really enjoy that. And I think the third thing about me, I'm an educator. Uh, you know, it's, it's my joy to teach and educate. I've got um, Sunday mornings, Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights. I'm on Facebook live with people following and uh, constantly teaching different aspects of different things. And, uh, I think those three things would pretty well describe me. Wow. Um, so if you had to create a slogan for your life, what would it be and why? Let go and let God. Because, you know, there's so much in life that we try to control that we can't. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that, you know, are beyond our control. Um, and there are so many things that we wish we could control that we may struggle all of our lives trying to get get a grasp on and 
and feeling like that, you know, okay, man, I finally, I've made it. Now I'm, I'm important. Now I've got charge of my life. And then you find something happens, so illness, uh, someone in the family, ha something happens that you can't control. And you realize how humble you have to be all over again, because you don't have as much charge as you think you did. You know, you're not as in charge of it. And so as you let go and let God, um, you see things from a different perspective and you see things differently. You get the bigger picture and the longer picture of what's at the end of the road and not just this, this moment of crisis, but what you can learn from it. I, I think that's been a big part of my life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could invite three people to dinner, living, dead, fictional, or real, who would they be and why? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I hate to be trite, you know, but, uh, man, I would love to sit down and have a long talk with Jesus and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, find out some things and get some questions answered that I haven't had answered. I, I don't understand tsunamis, why, you know, in some countries it will wipe out 100,000 people in a day. Um, I don't understand birth defects sometimes, you know, when you have children that are born with uh, severe birth defects. But not only that, um, you know, I, I just, boy, it would be so cool to just sit down with him and have a visit and just talk and find out. You know, sometimes I ask God, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? And, and just hear what, what's on God's heart. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be amazing. Um, you know, another person that when, when I was in middle school, I read biographies just voraciously. I enjoyed them. And uh, Benjamin Franklin always stood out to me because he always had a quote for everything. You know, I mean, he's just constantly was uh, so versatile and learning and uh, and writing and all those things. And so you know, it'd be a wonderful thing to find out how he did all that. It'd be terrible if he found out he plagiarized everything, but I'm just wondering. <laughs> uh, but I think that'd be great. Um, uh, you know, I, other than that, I mean, that would be the top two. If I've got to pick another one, somewhere I like to sit down. I mean, I know this is weird, you know, I know it's really strange, but um, I, I follow strange news at times. And uh, I kind of got a feeling that there's some alien people out there. I mean, you know, there's enough UFO sightings now that military uh, jet or fighter jets are finding. And I'd like to sit down and talk with an alien, find out what's going on with those people. Uh, yeah. You know, as strange as that is, that might make a good book, you know, a conversation with an alien. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of questions would an alien ask us about us? You know, why do you people do that down there? You know, yeah. Uh, I think an alien would probably ask me, why are you always on a diet, you idiot? Why don't you just think you're your food? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it'd be terrible if we wake up in heaven and God says, why did you always restrict what you're eating? I put it there for you to enjoy it, and you're always trying to cut back. <laughs> My wife and I just went to lunch, and uh, so, you know, I'm getting this keto-friendly pizza. What the crap is that? <laughs> Oh my god, my da my dad does keto, so I know exactly what you're talking about. It's kind it of was good, <laughs> you know. It's just a big slab of cheese with more cheese and meat on it. So yeah, no seriously. Um, if my ever doc, if my doctor ever gets a hold of me on the cholesterol thing, I'll be in trouble. But uh. <laughs> um, if you could read one book over and over again for the rest of your life, what would it be, and why? Yeah, well, I mean, the trite answer is the Bible. I mean, I love reading the Bible. And I enjoy that. Um, and I, you know, I get something different out of it every time I read it. Um, and I believe that's because the Holy Spirit speaks to me through God's word. And I enjoy that. Um, so, I mean, I have read it many, many times and I would read it many, many times more. I mean, you know, um, that'd be my top pick. Yeah. Uh, if you could eat one food for the rest of your life with without keto restrictions. Um, yeah, what would thank you. <laughs> Definitely ice oh, cream. <laughs> I mean, I could swim in ice cream. I'd be happy. You know, love me some ice cream. Uh, most any kind, anytime. Unless it's got fruit in it. I don't want ice cream with fruit in it. That's not, that's an oxymoron. That doesn't work. <laughs> uh, if you could instantly learn any skill, what would it be and why? Yeah. Um, as far as skills go, you know, something that I haven't learned or something I would want to learn a new skill. Um, maybe flying, you know, I think it'd be fun. You know, uh, I've got a fear of heights, so I'd have to conquer that. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, I had a friend take me up in a helicopter a couple a few years ago, and uh, the first five minutes, I thought I was going to go crazy. I was scared to death, you know. And it was a bubble helicopter, so it was the one that you know, there's nothing beneath you. I said, just me and eternity right there. If I, you know, you feel like you're going to fall out of it the whole time. But it was kind of like after the first five minutes, of kind of a peace came over me. I said, okay, well, look, if I'm going today, I'm ready. So if I go, I'll go. And uh, and we went on this ride. And he says, you want a, a simple, soft ride or you want the rough ride? I said, let's just go the simple ride. I don't need any danger in my life. And I enjoyed it. I really did. So, I mean, I think it'd be something I'd like to conquer, you know, uh, flying airplanes or helicopter or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you were an animal... What would you be, and why? Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty much a lion, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the kind of lion that I have a balance of uh, sitting and watching. Mm -hmm. You know, if you see lions, uh, you know, films and and watch, uh, you know, documentaries and things about them, you know, they're they're in the brush watching and watching and watching. Now, I'm not a predator by any means, so I don't eat people or eat. You know, I mean, I'm not that kind of lion. I'm the kind of lion that. Um, you know, I like to be in charge. I like to lead groups. I like to uh, know where we're headed and lead people with me, not behind me necessarily, but with me. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do like to sit and think about things and stare and observe and, and watch things. You know, I look at people and uh, even with my clients, you know, I, I kind of take a look at them. I'm like, let's figure out what happened. What's wrong with your life? What, what messed up in your life? And you, you, I ask those difficult questions because um, you know, the lion that sits and thinks about things finds the best answers. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I have that dichotomy in my life between thought and action. And when it's time to take action, I'm ready. And when it's time to kind of think about things, I'm ready and willing to do that. So. Um, what would you like to be known for? I really, you know, um, kind of like on my tombstone, you know. He really cared about people. And I do. I really do. I mean, it's not something I have to make up or I have to drudge up into my life. It's where I come from. Um, I just have a care for people. And I'd love for people to remember me for that. He really cared. Yeah. Um, there are now 25 hours in the day. How do you spend your extra hour? I should spend it or how I would spend it because I should over. freaking spend it in the gym <laughs> oh my god I, I I you know I draw cartoons right so I got mm -hmm. this cartoon I draw up a teddy bear uh -huh. with his arms crossed and his fist is clenched and he's angry I said uh -huh. that's my inner child when it's time to go to the gym <laughs> uh, what I should do is go to the gym what I would do what I would like to do eat ice cream I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could go on a one hour excursion uh, to the best ice cream in the world every day, you know, but uh, I mean, yeah, if I had an extra hour a day, I would want to do something that was productive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I enjoy writing and I got that sense down to do that, but to be able to sell and produce and to uh, publish and actually get things out, out, that's, that's what I need. If I had an hour a day to, produce things that would bring uh financial and uh emotional benefit to the, me and to the world I, that's what i would really want to do in our yeah. day you know um so the last set of questions that i have for you are quick fire which is don't think just answer okay. deep sea or outer space outer space um yeah <laughs> um i mean you know you got more freedom and motion and openness in that sense if you're underwater then uh i mean you can't breathe in either one unless you have the outright apparatus right yeah <laughs> so you're fried either way uh but I, I would yeah i would go to outer space i'd like to see what's going on out there spring summer fall or winter summer salty or sweet salted caramel ice cream <laughs> But I think the system. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Day or night. Uh, Day or night. Yeah. Uh, day. You know, I'm not a 
sleep a lot kind of person. I like to move and get around, move around, do things in the day. Mm -hmm. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Just because it's what I grew up on and uh, I like them, I, but I like it when they got a little crusty edge on the edge of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Just because I don't like the same old, same old, I want something a little different. Yeah. Uh, Coca Cola or Pepsi? See, I grew up on Pepsi Cola because we, we would take a bag of peanuts and put it in the Pepsi and uh, we'd eat the peanuts at the end of the Pepsi. You never heard of that. That's a North Carolina. No, thing. I have. I just thought that nobody else did that. Yeah, that's what I grew up on, but I like the taste of Coke better. I love Coke Zero. Uh -huh. And uh, so I like Coke, but I grew up on Pepsi, so now I'm betraying my roots, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, hamburgers or hot dogs? You locked up on me. Hamburgers or hot dogs? Hamburgers. I don't care for hot dogs. I don't know what's in them. <laughs> yeah, I feel the exact same way. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, nitrates. <laughs> uh fruits or vegetables fruits love pineapple yes. you know <laughs> vegetables are a chore well most of them, some of my life uh gold or silver what gold or silver see that fluctuates in the market because i mean you know you you would for my first thought was gold and i i prefer gold but then mm -hmm. there are times that silver has has more value than gold, but I like gold. Ketchup or mustard? Ketchup. Don't care for mustard. Uh, sandals or sneakers? Sneakers. Yeah. Milky Way or Snickers? <sighs> Snickers because it's got the nuts in it. You know, that gives it a little bit of crunchy yeah. variety. All right. Well, those are all the questions that I have for you today. Thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate everything that you shared. And I think the audience will get a lot out of it. Great.